Howdy art nerds! Today we are finally reviewing the top tier of Superior's watercolors. We're taking a look at the Superior Master level solid watercolors. Now I have really enjoyed Superior watercolors for the most part in the past, so I have high hopes for this set today. Dear art nerds, I've got another requested student grade showdown entry. Today we're taking a look at the Superior 48 Colors Master Level Solid Watercolor Set. We've reviewed a lot of Superior products here on the channel over the years and for the most part, I like Superior okay. So I have some pretty high expectations that their master level watercolors are really gonna blow me away for the price. So in today's video, we are gonna unbox these, we're gonna swatch these, we're gonna talk about some of the other Superior watercolors that we've checked out here on the channel, and I'm gonna find some comparable watercolors to compare it to. So before we get any further into this, let's go ahead and start unboxing. I believe I purchased this from the Dingy Boutique Store on AliExpress. I've bought from them several times and I've never been disappointed with, I can't say I've always loved everything I bought from them, but that's more a reflection on the product than on their customer service. And when things ship from the Dingy Store, they tend to come sooner than some of the other things I've ordered from AliExpress. But I will say, I find that AliExpress's wait times haven't gotten that much worse during the Panini and they're certainly better than Wish. So generally I don't have a big problem shopping from AliExpress because I do tend to stick to brands I'm familiar with. I try to make sure I'm not buying knockoffs and I try to stick to storefronts that I'm familiar with. So if you want to get your art supplies on AliExpress, those are some pretty, pretty straightforward tips. And basically, don't think you're gonna get something for nothing. Don't think you're gonna pay basically nothing and get a really phenomenal product. So speaking of, if I found the correct listing for the 48 half pan superior master level solid watercolors, I paid around 3103 and that can vary. Sometimes there's an active coupon going on. Sometimes you get like a first time buyer coupon. Sometimes you save money if you purchase a certain number of things from a store. So if you're gonna buy from AliExpress, that's another reason to try and keep it limited to just a few stores that you're familiar with because then you can actually utilize those uh, coupons. So this probably came in a plastic white bubble wrap mailer because that's pretty par for the course for stuff from AliExpress. I've had this for a little while as it's part of my student grade showdown. I wanted to review more of the superior stuff before I got to this one kind of working my way up. I've got a bunch of Mia stuff that I want to do the same thing with. So if you're interested in that, I hope you guys will, you know, click subscribe, click the bell notification and generally stick around. So it arrived in a fairly nice heavy duty cardboard box. It's like a slip case box. And it, this is a heavy chonker. It says not suitable for children under three years of age. You guys probably know how I feel about that. You really shouldn't be giving these kinds of watercolors. They make children grade watercolors for a reason. Kids do, very young kids do have a tendency to get it on their hands and then eat it. So please don't give something like this to a very young child. And it is Ningbo Superior Art Material Co. Limited. Since I've talked about Superior so much here on the channel, I'm not really gonna go into the company as much as I normally do when we're talking about a new company. So the slip case comes off fairly easily. We have what is probably a packing slip. This looks like a skew. Can somebody please tell me what these dust cloths are for? Because Paul Rubens loves to include these. Now, before I really get into this, I'm expecting something kind of on par with Paul Rubens or with Supervision or with Mungyo watercolors. So that's kind of the ballpark I'm looking at. And if you guys see a flash of gray, that would be Bowie's tail. He's decided he needs to be on my lap right now. As I've mentioned in quite a few of my other Chinese art supply reviews, I really love that these companies are going with very cute, like pastel color palettes. I'm actually starting to amass a collection of Easter egg colored watercolor palettes. And I have to say, as somebody who loves bright, beautiful color, I'm here for this. So let's take a look at what's inside this metal tin. It 
inside is pretty standard. We have what looks like our swatch card brochure with some information. I'll translate that for you guys in a minute. And a decently sized swatch card on what feels like cellulose watercolor paper. And then we have our 48 individually wrapped half pans. And Superior has a metallic set, very similar to this one. Since I am mostly trying to review like, you know, basic student grade palettes for this student grade showdown. I'm trying to keep it mostly to like very utilitarian palettes, but I would be interested in checking out their metallic palette. I'll go out on a limb though and say it's probably not that different from all the other metallic palettes on the market. Each half pan is individually wrapped. I do like that they are fairly simply wrapped. We don't have any plastic wrap. It seems to be a sticker, um, maybe not even adhesive on the top and this one's coming loose. So I am going to repurpose these like I generally do, and that's gonna lead to very little waste. So that's already like a big plus for this palette is there is very little waste with this palette, and I love to see it. I really hope these paints are good. Um, there's also not like a lot of included extras, which I feel good about because it tells me theoretically the cost actually went into the paint. So I'm hoping that we're gonna see some higher quality paints today. Thanks to Google Translate, I can give you guys at least some idea of what this says. A disclaimer if you're new, I unfortunately cannot speak or read any form of Chinese, not Cantonese, not Mandarin, so I am reliant on Google Translate. And Google Translate, while it has opened up the world to me in terms of art supplies, is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes to be taken with a grain of salt. So if there's some weird language going on, that's probably on Google Translate, just mistranslating things. So the front of our pamphlet says, Zhou Zhang Superior Master Level Watercolor Pigment Colloid Adopts. Gum Arabic produced in Khartoum, Africa with very good transparency, viscosity, fluidity, water solubility, antioxidation, non-discoloration, and other characteristics so that the pigment can play the most saturated and to achieve the best preservation effect. Product Production process. SUP professional watercolor production grinding will give different grinding weeks and four to eight weeks expansion and sedimentation period according to the individual toners with different properties and then grind again until stable. 48 colors show art ingenuity and focus. So basically what I think they're saying is they're using high quality gum Arabic from Africa and different pigments used in this process are gonna have different grinding properties. So it can take from up to four to eight weeks for each half pan to be completed just due to dry times, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. And then inside here, Ningbo Superior Art Material Co. Limited, Ningbo Superior Art <laughs> Material Co. Limited is a company specializing in art painting materials and providing high quality painting materials for artists and art lovers. It is a company integrating R&D production and sales in a comprehensive professional art painting material supplier. The product is designed and developed by well-known domestic artists combined with the artist's usage habits so it can meet the needs of art lovers and artists. The company's products cover a wide range of three levels, student level, expert level and master level. The types of watercolors include liquid watercolor, solid watercolor, half block, full block, super large block, spray can watercolor, etc. and cooperate with many well-known brands from all over the world and have been highly recognized by many well-known domestic artists. So I have, I have some state, I have some comments here. First off, it would be cool to see more of these products available in brick and mortar stores in the US under the Superior name. Superior does offer OEM and white label capabilities to other companies. So like those Artify watercolors we talked about not super long ago, that would be Superior watercolors. So that's why as an art supply reviewer, I try really hard not to review duplicates. I try to do my research, but sometimes companies are not entirely honest about who they're white labeling from. So generally I try to figure out who the source company is and just buy from there. So even though we're seeing it as superior today, and that is the parent company, you may encounter these watercolors or other superior watercolors as you're browsing Amazon or any other kind of cheapish, you know, not necessarily name brand watercolors might be white labeling these. Like companies like Arteza and Mozart, they don't make their own watercolors. They purchase them from other companies and then put their own name on it. So another thing is I haven't seen a whole lot of superior stuff in the US that I could identify as superior. Um, I know I've reviewed their student level and their master level. I don't know that I've reviewed, or this is their master level. I don't know that I've had a chance to check out their expert level. So if any of you guys 
know of a company that's selling superior watercolors under the expert level, even if it's like a different company name, uh, let me know in the comments. I'll try to include that as part of the review. I have not seen their liquid watercolors, their super large block watercolors, or their spray can watercolors, and that would be really interesting to try out. So again, if you know where I can get those, please let me know that down in the comments as well. So finally, our last page. Selection of natural mineral toners. Mining and research and development toners are from Europe master level watercolor paints. In addition to high color purity and many colors, different painting styles, themes, special effects, etc., must often be considered. So the selection is more important. It is necessary to carefully select the characteristics, density, hardness, weight, acidity, and alkalinity of each toner. Hard toners are usually heavier and they will appear more granular, but are also natural manifestations of settling effects such as PB28, PB36 Diamond Blue, PB14 Diamond Purple, PBK11 Iron Black, and most PBR7 Mineral Colors series have this function. The transparent color is PY150 Yellow, PY43 Iron Yellow, PBR25 Brown, PR83 Matter Red. These colors are very good in the use of later layers. In addition, in the high density toner part, there are PY35, 37 Copper Yellow, PO20, Copper Orange, PR108 Cadmium Red, PB28 Cobalt Blue, PV14 Diamond Purple, PG18.50, so that might be to a ratio of five, Diamond Green, all are expensive toners. So what I think they're saying, because they're actually covering some of watercolor's chemistry that I'm not as familiar with, which is really cool. Actually, I wish there was more information. I wish I didn't have to rely on Google Translate for it because I was learning. I did not realize that granulating colors are coming from harder. It makes perfect sense now that I read it, but granulating colors are coming from harder minerals and you can't necessarily granulate them as fine. I thought the reason you couldn't mill them down as fine was not because they're so hard, but because they would start to lose their color as the particle size gets smaller, it wouldn't reflect the same wavelengths. And probably a little A, a little B is true. Um, I would actually really love to know more about that. I'm always interested in the science behind our art supplies. And frankly, even though they love to shoehorn that A in steam, they really don't spend any time at all talking about <laughs> the S in art or, or how art and science so often intersect. And that's a bit of a pet hobby horse for me as somebody who loves both science and art and somebody with a minor in earth environmental science i'm interested in that and would love to learn more and that would have been such a useful gateway in my education that we just really couldn't spend enough time on but definitely open to learning more about that so if you know of anybody who can really get into the physics behind how color works in a interesting and art centric way because i I'm biased, I need it spoon fed to me, my special niche interests. Please let me know down in the comments below. So thank you Google Translate for helping us with this. It seems like there's some interesting info in here, um, especially if you're able to, to read it in its native tongue and actually parse it correctly and not have to look at it through the lens of Google Translate. But I am grateful that we even have Google Translate for that. So next, I'm going to go ahead and I am gonna unwrap all of these half pans, get the color info where I want it, and then we can actually start swatching on their swatch card. But before we do that, I wanna go ahead and disclose my own personal bias so that you guys know where I'm coming from. I'm a watercolor comic artist, so I'm not a watercolor for fine art. I'm not a watercolor for journaling. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but I make comics. I am a comic artist and illustrator. I paint the comic Seven Inch Kara, which you guys can read at seveninchkara.com. And I'd love to tell you a little bit more about it and show you some of the beautiful, beautiful art from Kara. If you enjoy Studio Ghibli, cottage core, and nature, I think you'll really enjoy my watercolor comic, 7-inch Kara. You can check it out as a webcomic at 7inchkara.com or purchase volume one or volume two or even both from the Natto shop. I hope you guys will check it out and let me know what you think.
So you guys can see I really care a lot about watercolor. Now when I'm doing the student grade showdown, that's not really for Kara. I like to use professional grade for seven inch Kara because I like to be able to rely on the paints to do specific things. I'm not as concerned about, you know, light fastness. Not that that's not a valid concern, but because I'm making art for reproduction and I print them in books, it's not going to see a lot of light. It's not going to be out all the time. It's not intended for display. So that isn't as high a priority for me as it would be for artists who are making art to sell or making commissions or making art to display. In fact, if my comic pages don't last the next 200 years, I literally just went to NOMA, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the other day, and they had pieces that were hundreds of years old, and some of them should have been dust a long time ago. And honestly... I hope a lot of my art is dust in a hundred years, mostly because I want it to be enjoyed now, but I don't think it should stand the test of time. I don't think it's, um, the books, I would love it if the books were still an important part of people's lives, much like Alice in Wonderland or the Chronicles of Narnia or, um, the Wizard of Oz, that sort of thing. Um, I would love that, but like the individual pages and the individual illustrations I create, I want them to bring joy to people. I want people to have them up in their homes and enjoy them, but I don't want them to be a testament to my death after I'm dead. I know that's weird, okay? Noma feels like being in a tomb, so. <laughs> and the way they display the art is very dead. So I, I, I have some thoughts and I'd love to do a vlog about it. They're still, they're still kind of percolating, as you guys can tell. But So anyway, as a comic artist, there are things I care about. I care about blendability. I care about wet-to-wet -wet techniques. I care about being able to execute certain techniques over and over again. I care about rewettability because I prefer to work from half pans, whether I have applied two watercolors into half pans and let them dry or I'm working just from half pans. I do care about affordability because I am painting hundreds of comic pages especially affordability with colors that I use all the time, like yellow ochre or ultramarine blue or alizarin crimson the, or even undersea green, those kinds of things. I do care about that a lot. Um, but for the student grade showdown, I'm actually, while I can never take off my comic artist glasses, I'm looking at this as an art educator, as somebody who frequently teaches watercolor and is often asked to recommend watercolors. And I used to just say, just skip student grade and go professional grade. You're going to be happier in the long run. And I generally do stand by that. But that was because I also grew up with Cotman as our student grade. And Cotman costs almost as much as professional grade Windsor and Newton. And companies like Superior have started coming into the U.S. at a lower price point and they are able to do things that our student grade watercolors don't. So that kind of made me revise how I feel about student grade watercolors. And also, to be real, in the U.S., art supplies are overpriced. I mean, you go to Japan and you're going to pay like half the price for Windsor Newton half pans that you'd pay in the U.S. So I'm also kind of looking at it with that lens, too, that we already are paying extra for the privilege of being able to create art here in the U.S. because it's just not subsidized by as many people having traditional art as a hobby. So... Hopefully you guys will check out 7-Inch Kara. Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. And hopefully you'll stick around and check out the whole Unbox and Swatch because generally with the Unbox and Swatch, I try to keep it very general. Many different kinds of artists could find this useful. Whereas with my field test, that's when I actually paint a watercolor illustration and I put it through the kind of paces that I would normally put paints through. And while that can be more specific to illustrators and comic artists, hopefully... I'm able to answer people's more generalized questions as well. So let's start unwrapping all 48 of the Superior watercolors. Every adhesive wrapper includes the name Superior, artist watercolors, the color number and the color name. Then the side has a barcode and the other side has the vehicle, which would be gum Arabic, the pigment, the national resistance grade, as well as the transparency. Before we get to unwrapping these, let's actually talk about what's on the packaging. So on the front, Superior Artist Watercolor, we have our color number B22, or B220, sorry, and our color name. We have a small barcode over here. And then on the other side, we have our, something I can't read, unfortunately, our pigment info, that might be our light fast info. And then again, something I cannot read. So 
I guess I'm not gonna do it for all of these because that's 48 half pans, but I am kind of curious what I'm missing out on. So I guess I will take that to the Google Translate. So it's a good thing I did translate it because it is actually useful information. So the side says vehicle gum Arabic. Then we have our pigment. Then it says national resistance grade and gives the number six. Not super sure what that means. That could be light fastness. And then this is transparency and for this particular color it's translucent so normally watercolor companies have those little pictograms that depict translucency which is great because it doesn't matter if you read the language you can decipher the pictograms do wish superior would go that route but frankly if they're going to include pigment information i can't complain because i have reviewed so many superior products where i couldn't get the pigment info that i am just happy that they're actually treating me like an artist who's curious about her art supplies information including pigment information will be down in the show notes below I found the wrappers fairly easy to remove they were adhesive on all three sides so all I did was I cut off the barcode and I restuck it back onto the half pans Since this half pan came out while I was unpeeling it, I wanted to show you guys just how dry and folded that thing looks. You'll be able to find the pigment names and color names down in the description below along with the rest of the show notes. So now that I have everything unwrapped, I noticed that these are extruded paints and some of them seem a bit dry. Most seem to be sig single pigment paints. Only a couple are double or triple pigments. So in an earlier video, I pointed out that paints were extruded paints and somebody wanted to know why that was a problem. It's not really a problem, it's just an observation. Generally, in my personal experience, poured paints reactivate a little bit quicker, just tend to be a little faster to use. I've had better experiences in general. But it doesn't mean that extruded paints are bad. You just sometimes have to be a little bit more patient with them and often cheaper paints are extruded paints. So kind of like how optical brighteners are not the worst thing ever. It's just a red flag that you can look for. There are extruded paints that are really high quality, good paints, and there are poured paints that are really cheap and poor quality. It really is just something to kind of keep your eyes out for. So next we are going to swatch on their included swatch booklet. Talking about red flags, I gave this a spritz of water, actually a couple of spritzes of water to kind of pre-activate the paints to give them the best chance of, you know, delivering the pigment and delivering the saturation. And I am starting to see a little bit of optical brighteners on some colors, some more than others, some aren't bad at all. And again, that's just a red flag. That's just something to look out for. Generally, optical brighteners is the addition of chalk or PW6, some, something white, to make your watercolors really stand out and look brighter and more appealing in the half pans. And this is really pretty common with cheaper brands. The reason this can be a problem is because it really affects how the colors mix, how the colors layer, how quickly you use up the colors. So if you're just a one layer kind of person or a brush calligrapher, it might not be a problem at all. But if you're somebody who paints layers on top of layers on top of layers, like a comic artist or an illustrator, that can be an issue. And that's definitely something you wanna be aware of before you pull out a palette and start painting with it. Since we're swatching on their paper, I will go over the colors included in this set as well as the pigments used. But I'm going to tape their paper down first with some washi tape just to make sure that it doesn't buckle or kip as we swatch our watercolors.
this is pretty frustrating. I don't know if it's a me thing and my brain's just not working or if it's a superior thing, but I am pretty sure this is all just slightly out of order compared to the half pans, the order that they put the half pans in. And uh, I guess I should have like double checked and then reordered them, but I honestly think that's a, a little bit unreasonable. I think that's a quality assurance thing. I do actually have it written out what order they're in in the half pans uh, compared to what order it is right here. So that's kind of how I know that these seem to be out of order and I'm just like all, all confused now. So that's, that's not good. I really wanted to use their swatch sheet. So what I think I'm going to do is I think I am going to have to stop for a little bit and kind of print out my notes rather than working with them from a computer and just like work really hard and to make sure they're they're aligned because I don't want this to be not in order even though I really prefer to make my own color maps I do know that the color maps can be really helpful to you guys but since it's tripping me up uh, I don't know if it's my ADHD or if it's all out of order or what but it doesn't seem to be in the same order as it is in the palette so I just wanted to point that out to you guys so that you don't just blithely swatch it thinking that they correspond so now don't. that I've got the color order figured out we can actually talk about the colors that are in this set just a reminder that I'm going to have the color and pigment info down in the description so make sure you guys check that out so on the first row we have A203 Titanium White which is PW6, C202 Naples Yellow Light which is PY53, A106 Skin which uses PY35, A233 Permanent Lemon Yellow which uses PY3, D243 Cadmium Yellow Medium which uses PY35, A247 Permanent yellow medium which uses PY65, A152 transparent medium yellow which uses PY65, C150 gamboge which uses PY150, B252 indian yellow which uses PY83, D238 cadmium orange yellow which uses PO20, D216 cadmium orange which uses PY150, B254 permanent orange red which uses PO73, and that is the first row. As you guys see, I am swinging the cup of water beneath the camera so that you guys can see how much these watercolors muddy the water, how much opacity they add to the water. That's a pretty good indication of the addition of optical brighteners to make the colors look a little bit brighter in those half hands. The next row is B222 Scarlet, which is PR123. B213 Magenta, which is PR122. B229 Chinese Red, which is PR254. D215 Cadmium Red, which is PR108. B212 Rose Red, which is PV19. B220 Matter Red, which is PR177. C313 Violet, which uses PV19. B213 Royal Purple, which uses PV19 and PV29. D115 Permanent Violet, which uses PV23. E290 Cobalt Blue, which uses PV28. A298 Indigo, which uses PV19, PB15, and PBK6. And B193 France Ultramarine, which uses PB29. Our next row is A194, the Peacock Blue, PB17, A308, C Blue, PB15.3, A297, Prussian Blue, which uses PB27, A340, Penny Gray, which uses PBK7, A299, Payne's Gray, which uses PB15, PB29, and PBK9, E292 Turquoise Light, which uses PB36. D182 Turquoise Deep, which uses PG26. A602 Malachite Green, which uses PY101 and PB17. A160 Emerald Green Deep, which uses PG7. C183 Hooker's Green Brilliant, which uses PG17. B174 Olive Green, which uses PG36, PY12, PR101, and PW5. And A170 Tree Green, which uses PG36, PY12, PR101, and PW5. 
And then finally, for our last row, we have A166 Permanent Green, which uses PG36 and PY74. A168 Yellow Green, which uses PG36 and PY74. B324 Lemon Sienna, which uses PY42. A234 Yellow Ochre, which uses PY42. C255 Naple Yellow, which uses PBR24. B277 Raw Umber, which uses BR7. A334 Umber, which uses PR101 and PBR7. B318 Pazuli Red Ochre, which uses PR101. A339 Van Dyke Brown, which uses PBR7. A333 Burned Sienna, which uses PB7. A366 Burned Brown, which uses PBR7. And finally, B322 Ivory Black, which uses PBR9. These extruded paints seemed a bit dry. Most are single pigments and only a couple are double or triple pigments. And these seem pretty saturated. Some of the colors are pretty similar and some dry way different from how they look when they're wet. And I feel like magenta and violet are maybe swapped. Some of the earth tones are kind of weak like raw umber, but I'm seeing some granulation as well as some interesting colors. So if anything, you're kind of spoiled for choice. They're not as gritty as the Mung Yo and they're not as soupy as the Phoenix. These have had a chance to dry. If you hear a hissing noise in the background, I'm running a load of laundry and while the door shut, it might pick it up. So just wanted to kind of give you guys a heads up about that. So these seem pretty saturated. Some of the colors, in fact, a lot of the colors, like, like seriously, like cadmium yellow, permanent yellow, medium transparent, medium yellow, very, very similar. I'm not really sure why we need three of almost the same color in one palette. Um, and some dry way different from how they look when they were initially wet. And I feel like the magenta or the magenta and the violet maybe got swapped since this is really more of a magenta color and this is more of a violet color. Some of the earth tones are kind of weak, like raw umber is pretty weak. And we have three very similar colors in yellow ochre, Naples yellow, and their raw umber but I'm seeing some granulation as well as some interesting colors. So if anything, you're kind of spoiled for choice. These aren't as gritty as the Mung Yo and they're not as soupy as the Phoenix watercolors, but we've still got a lot of testing left to do. So I'm gonna remove this from my tabletop and we're gonna move on to my preference when it comes to swatching watercolors. We're gonna be swatching today, as we do every day, Pinky, on the Blick Studio Cotton Rag Watercolor Block. I like swatching on this because it is a good, yet fairly inexpensive compared to other cotton rag papers block. It gives me a good baseline of comparison. Pretty much all of my other student grade showdown swatches are on this paper or a smaller version of this paper. It's also block bound, so it's not going to be kipping and rippling. I feel like this is gonna be the fairest way to test any watercolors. So that's why I like to use this particular brand. I don't have any kind of affiliation with Blick. It's just their store brand, so it's a little bit more economical. So I am going to use a black alcohol marker that's gonna allow us to test for opacity without creating a resist because I used to use India ink or even pigment ink and both of those would create a bit of a resist and that made it very difficult to tell if something was actually opaque, if it won't actually sit on the paper. Now this sometimes does get reactivated, like it does this weird color chromatography thing and that's not the best either, but this isn't really meant to be like forever permanent swatches. This is just to give us some you know, baseline ideas of how these paints handle. And while I do ha hang on to these swatches, these aren't the swatches I reference if I'm actually using the palette. I'll go ahead and make a color map. So I don't even use their included swatch sheets most of the time because I find that they take up too much space. So I'm going to attempt, and I am just so spatially inept, I'm gonna attempt to do four lines since we have 48 colors. That would be 12 colors per line. 
and we're gonna be looking at a few different things today if you normally watch my unboxing swatches then you know what we're looking for we're going to be looking for opacity and opacity isn't a good thing or a bad thing in general but you do want to see some colors more opaque than others because they do utilize different pigments we're going to be looking at how the colors wash out generally with really cheap dye based watercolors as soon as you add water it just falls apart it turns to nothing so we're going to be looking for that we're going to be looking for granulation because like with opacity we should be seeing varying degrees of granulation some colors are going to granulate more than others and if the pamphlet they included is the truth and i would love it if it was the truth but we can't always take what our supply companies say at face value then they are intentionally utilizing some colors that are more granulating that, uh, than others because the minerals that they're utilizing are harder minerals so you're gonna see a little bit more of that granulation once it's had a chance to dry we're also going to be lift testing so you know scrubbing very gently applying a paper towel and seeing how much they lift again like granulation and opacity we should actually be seeing different degrees of liftability and i'm also going to keep an eye out for optical brighteners which we talked about a little bit earlier on it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world some colors you would definitely expect that like our turquoise light in our for some reason this is a, tur a turquoise deep maybe they misnamed it i don't know but we should see some opacity with that now what I don't want to see is I don't want to see our colors start to fall apart, i.e. basically turn into nothing or we get strange color chromatography that isn't really in line with what those colors are or what the pigment info tells us about these colors. I don't want to see uniform granulation. I don't want to see uniform opacity. I don't want to see uniform... Um, like everything just feels kind of flat and kind of dead since we're working with pigments I want to see some variety since we have a variety of pigments and then once we finish doing our swatching we're gonna do some color mixing because a good watercolor palette even a really large one like this one you should be able to mix the colors that you want and as a watercolor comic artist and illustrator I'm having to mix specific colors all the time that's just part of what I do having a larger palette like this is a convenience it's handy but you still want to add some nuance to your work and some personality and make it personal to you by mixing some of your own colors so we're going to do atomic and we're going to do optical mixing tests to see how that handles and then finally we're going to do the wet into wet test which has felled many a watercolor palette in this showdown where we're going to use a smaller Blick Studio cotton rag watercolor block. Uh, we go through a lot of paper here on this channel and we're going to just, you know, saturate it with water and then add a bunch of color and just see what happens because that can really tell you a lot about how watercolors are going to handle in a field test situation. So since a significant amount of time passed between swatching on their paper and being able to switch on the Blick, swatch on the Blick Studio paper, I re-spritzed them with some clean water and I am definitely on the lookout for some granulation I'm on the lookout for basically a variety of effects since we're dealing with a variety of colors one thing that is really apparent to me is how many kind of repeat pigments we're seeing in here especially repeat pigments from colors that present very similarly so you do get repeat pigments sometimes like for example uh, French ultramarine and Prussian blue sometimes you or they sometimes use the same pigment for that but one is a cool blue and one is a warm blue we're getting repeat pigments for like three warm yellows that are almost identical or for a couple of browns that are almost identical and neither of them are the best version of that color particularly with the earth tones with this set I feel like the earth tones are kind of weak and that's something I've really noticed with these cheaper watercolors is they tend to do the really bright saturated almost fluorescent colors quite well but when it comes to more natural or subtle colors things really start to fall apart so that's a bit disappointing because to me I use those neutral colors a lot those are really pretty important for you know painting comic pages and painting people whereas those beautiful bright brilliant colors are great for painting flowers and floral illustration but not so not as useful for painting people.
as I'm swatching, I'm looking for how much the colors cake up on my brush. I'm also looking for granulation, opacity, how the colors wash out when we add water because a lot of the really cheap dye-based watercolors basically turn to nothing when you add water. And then once these dry out, I'm going to try lifting them and we'll take a look at liftability. I'll definitely give this set one thing for sure. These colors are very saturated. So if you're a brush calligrapher or maybe a floral watercolor painter, this might be an economical set. That might be fun to play around with or utilize if you happen to teach classes. Our superior watercolors have had a chance to dry and they're really looking a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot like the Etcher watercolors that I reviewed for you guys not too, too long ago. So I'm definitely going to include Etcher in our watercolors for comparison, but since Superior is a common white label company and since Etcher is not forthcoming with who is manufacturing their watercolors, it wouldn't surprise me if it were Superior watercolors, especially because some of those colors look so much like how the Superiors swatched. Now what's interesting is that, I'm sorry, how the Etcher swatched. What's interesting is that Etcher has gone with some unusual pigment mixes for some of their colors, which might make it a little bit easier for us to identify colors in common or, you know, the same paints, maybe. I don't know. No one's going to cop to anything. It's all supposition. So take it with a massive grain of salt. But if Etcher is white labeling the superior watercolors and you were thinking about getting the Etcher watercolors, you would pay a lot less. I mean a lot less. Like the Etcher watercolors were $45 for a 25 half pan set versus around $30 for a 48 half pan set from Superior. So it's kind of like with Mungyo and some of the companies that white label from, from Mungyo. You know, you could pay that higher price tag, but why would you? Especially in this instance, when the palette is just so stinking cute. So next, I'm going to do the lift test. And we're going to be looking to see how liftable these are. Something that's very heartening for me, though, we're not getting any interesting washes in terms of, like, nice, soft gradation. There just wasn't enough space for that when we're swatching 48 colors. But these did not fall apart. They didn't turn to nothing. None of these colors turned to nothing, which... Now that I say it, it sounds so pitiful, but how many watercolors have we reviewed as part of this student grade challenge that as soon as we added water, they just basically evaporated. It all, all potency, all color was lost. So at the very least, these can take some water. Now, a downside is if these are the same as the Etra watercolors, the Etra watercolors have some light fastness issues that might not make them suitable if you paint to display your work or you paint to sell your work. So if they're the same thing, you know, same thing applies. But if you're an artist who's painting for reproduction, whether you're painting to create stickers or you're painting to create prints or you're painting to create books, this might be an economical option for you to consider. Disappointing for me, all of the colors are fairly lifting. So when it comes to watercolor, when we're dealing with different pigments, you do want to see different degrees of lifting and staining. And all of these were pretty lifting. This might be a set though that benefits from not pre-activating 
before you start painting and that way it doesn't cake up on your brush and you're not putting as much pigment down on the paper so it's not as thick so it's not as prone to lifting. Disappointingly, these colors are really pretty lifting. You would want to see a variety of staining and lifting properties since we're dealing with a variety of pigments and they all have unique properties. So it could be that super premium gum Arabic binder that they were touting. It could be some additional additive. Unfortunately, this is why while it would be really nice to be able to believe all the claims that art supply companies make about their products, we just can't because they don't always perform as promised. And before we get into color mixing, I also want to point out if you've had a different experience with these watercolors, if you've had worse issues, if you've had fewer issues, please let me know. Companies kind of change the quality of the product from time to time. And that's particularly true with the products that you can get on AliExpress. Sometimes it feels a little bit like a bait and switch where people who buy it really early on have really great experiences and then as demand increases and maybe the, the companies can't keep up, they either find someone else to manufacture it or they find a lower price point or what have you, but quality can dip, especially in a race to the bottom. So I just want to acknowledge that Sometimes I get a product and it's great and other people hate it. Sometimes I review a product and I hate it and other people love it. And there's always room to account for taste and usage. That's why I disclosed my bias early on. But also sometimes with these cheaper art supplies, the quality does drastically vary depending on when you purchased it. So if you guys had a different experience than I did, please let me know down in the comments below. I am super curious. Like right now, they're okay. I think these are probably the same as the Etcher watercolors. And if I can get any kind of decent confirmation, then for the field test, I'm not gonna field test both. I'm just gonna field test the superior palette since that's the larger color palette. And that way we're not doing duplicates of field tests. So next, we're gonna do some color mixing. And that's when I pull out yet another Blick cold press cotton rag watercolor block. Gotta buy these in bulk because I go through them so quack, quick with all these unbox and swatches. So basically we're gonna do two types of color mixing. We're going to do atomic where we take two colors and we smash them together to get our secondary color. And we're gonna do optical where I create a grid and I'm gonna glaze colors on top of each other to create the visual effect of a secondary color. And this can be a great indication of just how well these are gonna handle at color mixing so you can mix the colors you want as well as at a very common watercolor technique, glazing. I don't know about you guys, but in my comics, most of how I build up color and build up saturation and build up shading is through glazing. So it's really important that I'm able to do that technique with watercolors. And not all watercolors are created equal because those of you who watched my Mia field test will know that those are not capable of glazing at all. So it's a pretty important test. So I allow the pans to have a chance to dry and I'm not going to pre-activate these with water to see if they handle a little bit better. I'm gonna start by doing the vertical lines for our optical grid. So this gives them a chance to kind of dry while we do our other color mixing. So I am selecting just kind of visually a warm yellow, a cool yellow, a warm red, a cool red, a warm red, a blue red, except I did that in reverse. So <laughs> I have the warm yellow, the cool yellow, the cool red, the warm red, the cool blue, the warm blue. And it's pretty easy to find those colors. While that dries, I'm moving on to our atomic mixing. And while I can mix colors, many of the mixes are kind of chalky and dull, particularly among the greens and purples. Granulation is a smidge more apparent, but it's not as noticeable as I'd like. Now I did find that not preacting Preactivating these allowed for easier color control and less waste, but some requires do some colors do require more scrubbing. 
So you can see the purples are just really not that impressive. Often I also like to do some like convenience color mixes. So I'm mixing up Payne's Gray using ultramarine and a few different browns. And that's also a good indicator of colors kind of granulating out or offering something more interesting than kind of your baseline. So for the optical, these seem to glaze without much, if any, reactivation. And I seem to be using these paints up fast. I'm not really surprised because these feel like they have a lot of extension extender or something just based on how much they cake up on the brush after activation and how much they tend to lift. These probably work okay for artists who have a lighter hand. This time I didn't bother to pre-activate the paints again. I wanted to see how quickly they could activate on their own. And it's a little bit easier for color control and definitely less paint waste, but some colors require a lot more scrubbing. And just for context, whenever I'm working on illustrations or comic pages, I always spritz my Daily Driver watercolor palette, which is just full of different brands of professional grade watercolors. I always spritz it with water first. So pre-activating is something that I do for pretty much any paint I'm using. And it's really only with student grade that I've noticed some do a lot better without the pre-activation. So that's why I mentioned it to you guys. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are used to doing that and would do that and wonder why the paints aren't working so well. Or if you're struggling to get your paints to like wake up and give you some color, you might not be aware of that tip. So now you know. Anyway, uh, they seem to do a little bit better without the pre-activation, but some colors, especially some of the neutrals, require a lot more scrubbing. So for the atomic mixing, so that's here where we took the two colors and we mashed them together. I, while I can mix colors, many of the mixes are kind of chalky and dull, particularly among the greens here and the purples. And this is surprising because like a cool yellow plus a cool blue should make a really pretty vibrant green. It shouldn't be as chalky as this and it's cha a lot chalkier in person um with the warmer yellows and warmer blues you are going to get those kind of more olive-ish mixes that's pretty normal but even these feel chalky like there's been some optical brighteners added particularly in maybe those lighter colors to really get the colors to pop in the half pans but they don't do so well in mixing and same problem with the purples it just wasn't really that easy to get a good purple and yeah there is a good purple in the set but this is a test. We are using this to see how well these colors play together. I also did some other mixes. I like to also mix a Payne's Gray because I can tell you a lot about it. And usually Payne's Gray is Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine Blue. Their Burnt Sienna is real weird. So I just moved on over and found something that looked like a Burnt Sienna which I mean not really like this didn't really work out right and I had a lot of trouble getting that color this was a little bit easier and it says this is burnt sienna I'm more used to this see to me this would be burnt sienna and this would be umber it's like they've sw swapped them and then I also mixed a couple of purples using their op opera rose um it's not listed as opera rose it's like rose pink or something but that thing is gonna be who boy fugitive I mean, most of these are Who Boy Fugitive, but that one in particular is gonna be Who Boy Fugitive. And then with the magenta color. So that's a little bit better of a purple, but still not clean, not a lot of clarity to these colors. So, you know, you, you might just wanna be aware of that. And then for optical mixing, these seem to glaze okay without much, if any, reactivation. So I seem to be using these paints up fast, like especially with this blue over here. And I'm not really surprised because these feel like they have a lot of extender or something. It's just based on how much they cake up on the brush after activation and how much they tend to lift and how chalky some of these mixes are. It kind of gives me a clue that there's something kind of weird going on here. But these probably work okay with a lighter hand. So once this finishes drying, I'm gonna use my palette knife, I'm gonna remove it, and we can do our wet into wet test. And what I'm gonna be looking for with the wet into wet test is I 
um, everything. <laughs> Give me everything. Uh, I want to see if the colors diffuse cleanly into the water. If we get some really nice misty granulation or does it tend to chalk up or clump up. If we dip non-opaque or not traditionally opaque colors into, you know, a mass of color, is it going to leave a little halo of white around it? Um, I, I've reviewed some really not, 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 not high performing, in my opinion, student grade watercolors. Artiza, I'm looking at you. And uh, so I'm basically making sure these don't do any of the things that those do. And I would expect, I'm still expecting these to perform about on par with the Etcher, because I, I think Etcher is probably white labeling these, and with the Mungyo, and maybe with the Phoenix. And after we finish doing our wet into wet test and it's had a chance to dry fully, we can actually start talking about some of those other brands because we'll have plenty of points of comparison and we can start making some educated guesses. So for the wet into wet test, I am saturating my paper with some clean filtered water and I'm just gonna dab in some paint. I'm working with a large Paul Rubens watercolor brush, so a fairly soft brush, and I'm able to pick up a fair amount of pigment. The colors go down pretty saturated while they're still wet. They don't diffuse out quite as much as one might want, but they do intermix quite readily. And I'm going for kind of a gamut of colors here. So basically I kind of start out by applying a rainbow of color to the paper. I might go back in and add in some additional colors. I'm not really trying to make art, although sometimes these are very pretty to look at. I'm really trying to make something that's gonna tell a story to me as the art supply reviewer. So now I'm dabbing in some of the more opaque or the more saturated colors. So I'm dabbing in like the Naples yellow and I'm dabbing in the, tur the cobalt turquoise and I'm dabbing in the Chinese red. And what I'm gonna be looking for when this dries is I'm going to be looking for like white rings around our colors. And unfortunately, I'm starting to see just that. Our superior wet into wet test has had a chance to dry fully overnight. And while the colors are still pretty vibrant, I am definitely seeing some opacity rings in colors that I shouldn't be seeing those kind of white halos. Now, with some of these colors, like those really light blues and the turquoises, I really expected that. There's a reason they're pastel, but with the purple, it's not really, that's not really a good look. It's not a cute look for a purple. And for the red, I'm not surprised. I think that was Chinese red, so it's meant to be a more opaque red, but it's still a little disappointing because I was hoping that these colors were going to achieve their saturation from the pigments utilized, not from the inclusion of optical brighteners or other kinds of extenders or additives. Same goes over here for that cobalt blue. Now, not every color does this. We do get some really nice transitions with some colors, but it's something I'm definitely going to be aware of and something I'm going to keep an eye out for when I do the field test. So I've completed all the unbox and swatch testing for the superior master level watercolors. I think I have enough information that we can actually talk confidently about the competition and whether this watercolor set is right for you or if you should get one of the other sets. To begin the comparisons, I'm going to compare Superior against Superior. And I don't have all the Superior products that I've reviewed here, mostly because some of them are still packed away. So I'm going to include inserts from that just for your reference in case you're curious about what Superior makes. Now, in general, I really like Superior because they're one of those art supply companies that gets really weird with it. And they tend to be more innovative in terms of form factor than other watercolor companies. This palette here is honestly the most normal palette I've seen them produce. Well, this and the plastic one, those are their pretty average palettes, but they make some really unusual palettes, including that collapsible cup palette that I reviewed for you guys, the folding fan palette that I reviewed for you guys, that watercolor watch palette that everybody is white labeling right now. And they also make 
this folding fan style or folding screen style palette that I reviewed for you guys that kind of kicked off the student grade showdown to begin with. And not all of them are a huge hit. Sometimes the form factor makes using the paints really difficult, like with the fan palette, that's just a pass for me. But at least they're doing something different and unusual. And you will see their more unusual palettes white labeled by all sorts of different companies. Jane P Davenport likes to white label them. Jerry's Artorama white labels them. I've seen like a bunch of impossible to pronounce Amazon brands white label them. So Superior definitely makes the rounds and generally I feel like they're behind most of the cheap watercolors on the internet. So I really liked this palette. I don't have the swatches for this, but I do have the field test that I was able to paint with it. And what I really liked about this palette is that I forgot I was doing a field test and I just kind of fell into painting. These paints were able to do a lot of the techniques that I would really want from more professional grade watercolors. And I didn't really feel like I was dealing with student grade watercolors. In fact, I forgot that I was using such an unusual form factor and it just became really natural for me to paint with this. Now, they did take up a lot of desk space and they don't, they still don't seem to be refillable. It's not like you can buy or I haven't found anywhere where I can buy the chiclets from. But I just really like them and I had a lot of fun painting with them. I haven't necessarily done the field test for this palette here, but I am pretty convinced that this palette is actually this palette, just white labeled and the colors renamed and some rebranding. Now, I don't have any confirmation. It is just a guess. Ain't nobody admitting to nothing. This palette has pigment information. This one doesn't, which makes it kind of hard to compare notes. But if they are indeed the same palette, then I've already done the field test for that. Now, I didn't like this for this illustration as much as I like that weird folding palette for this illustration. The paints did handle differently. There might be a slight difference in formulation just to allow for the, the chiclet form factor. And maybe that doesn't work so well in a half pan or maybe they change their formulation. I'm not sure. It's still a good palette and I still enjoyed painting with it. It just wasn't as natural or as easy for me, but it did have some really pretty colors and I was able to paint something that I ended up being quite happy with. So if you're interested, I would say go for the cheaper one that has the colors you want. Uh, it can be difficult to find the, this is, even though it's white labeled as Artified, this is the Superior palette. It can be difficult to find this particular version of it in the 48. So you may want to pay a little extra and go for the Shapiro Farben set. It does come with two water brushes and a pad of paper. I hated their pad of paper. So if you go with the Superior Farben set, just, just toss that paper. It's not particularly impressive or particularly good. So I would say this would be their student grade version. I'm not sure if this falls into expert or what, because some of their weird format stuff, who, who knows what grade that's intended to be. I think a lot of it just comes from the novelty of the interesting form factor. But if you know, please let me know because it can be really difficult to get information for that. So here are the swatches for the Artify slash Superior palette. So, you know, decent color saturation, not necessarily a lot of granulation with a couple of exceptions, fairly lifting, able to mix colors well, able to glaze colors, did decently well in the wet into wet test, although we do get some halos. I think we're not getting as many halos as we got from the expert line, which is a little, a little weird, a little concerning. Let me move things over just a bit so we can see. So here are the color mixes for the expert line. I actually think these are a little chalkier than these, but I think the problem is I had pre-activated them. I was picking up way too much paint. I think this is one of those palettes. And actually, now that I think back on it, this palette also didn't do well with pre-activation. It tends to get really soupy. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. I think it glazed a little bit better. And I think this palette and all of these are on the Blick Studio paper, just different sizes. So that's one of the reasons I try to consistently swatch on the same paper. It allows us to compare without having to, you know, 
consider all the variables. It allows us to remove some variables so we can do a head-to-head -head comparison. I think the greens mix cleaner in the cheaper palette. I think the purples mix cleaner in the cheaper palette. So that's that's not ever, you know, what I want to see or say. I would I would like it if it was like a pretty clear cut, straight like quality improvement. So this is the wet and to wet test for the their expert line. This is the wet and to wet test for the Artify rebrand. I think these might have more dye based pigments, dye based colors than this. Um, and I, part of that is me going by, I actually have pigment information for this. And while there are like indigo is technically a dye based pigment um, and it's a commonly accepted dye based pigment. Generally, you don't want a bunch of dye based pigments in your watercolor set. That's a cost cutting measure and those tend to be incredibly light fugitive. But if this is the same as the etcher set, it's also going to be incredibly light fugitive. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. But I almost feel like the wet and to wet test went better for the cheaper one than for the more expensive one because we're not getting as many halos. But we are getting more granulation and more interesting variety in how the paints themselves handle. And then going way back, here are our swatches. So this is the 48 set. This is the 24 set. I feel like the 48 set, the colors in it, like the actual pigments and how they granulate and how they look on the paper, it does actually have more impact and more oomph than what I'm seeing here. This feels kind of weak compared to what I'm seeing here. Now I like granulation. I feel like granulation adds some visual interest to the watercolor and keeps it from being too flat. There are artists who do beautiful things with India ink watercolors and with dye based watercolors. I'm not one of them. So that, you know, I'm not disparaging artists who like that kind of very flat look. I just prefer more grit and more interest. It makes my art look more interesting. So I feel like just in terms of the swatches, the 48 set is a bit better than the 24 set. But, I'm, you know, this is one of those things where a field test is really going to help me decide. It's going to crystallize my feelings for this. And the price difference isn't so egregious that um, it would really push you out of using one over the other. But, I mean, every dollar saved counts. So I definitely want to be able to recommend to you guys which palette is going to make you happiest and serve your needs in the long run. And I'm not always impressed by like a huge array of colors, especially when we have a lot of very similar colors kind of taking up space in the palette. And that is one thing to be said for the the Artify rebrand is it doesn't necessarily spend a lot of space on repeated colors. but their their neutrals are so weak and while i complained that the neutrals in the 48 cent weren't as strong as i would like they are way stronger than the neutrals a little in montage from set. my first superior palette review this was a white labeled product i think it was sold as diane v and this is that weird folding palette while i did not like the form factor i found it really difficult to use and difficult to balance and that the paints kind of get all over each other i wasn't not happy with the quality of the paints inside and I kind of figured that if a, another superior palette were to come my way I would definitely be open to trying it but the form factor for this is just a mess it does not really work well for home use and it doesn't really work well for travel use If you're curious about this palette or any of the other ones I'm going to mention, I'll have all of the reviews linked for you guys down in the description below. So hopefully you'll check them out. Next is the Weird, the Wild, the Wonderful watercolor watch. I actually was really charmed by this. This is the first travel palette, like micro travel palette, that I felt really worked well for travel. I even took it to Cheekwood Botanical Garden to do some plain air painting. It straps to your wrist, hence watercolor watch. 
And while it doesn't hold a lot of paint, there is a pretty good color selection and it's just so dang cute. And you also get some spare colors, not necessarily refills, just additional colors so that you can actually customize the palette itself. Now they sell these in a few different sizes and Jane Davenport is currently white labeling this. It's way cheaper to just get it from Superior. So just get it from Superior. You can find them on AliExpress and I will link the review and the field test for you guys down in the description below if you're as charmed by this weird watercolor watch as I was. Here's a montage from when I actually took it out into Cheekwood. Yeah, I actually wore it and I used it to do some plain air painting and I wore it for the whole day. It does get a little bit sweaty and that can make it kind of start to shift on your wrist, but it works quite well both in the home and in the field and even has these tiny little mixing surfaces, which are, they're ridiculous, but you do actually end up using them and they're a lot of fun. So you guys can start to see why I'm kind of entranced by Superior. They make some really weird stuff. This is one of the weirder of their things that I've reviewed that I really liked, but for less weird, slightly less weird, this folding watercolor palette is another Superior product. So this is one of those where you fill it yourself and it's got a silicone gasket. And I've started seeing the cups sold separately as well as the little palette on top sold separately. But I think the combination itself is a great combination and it works quite well. I like that I can curate the color palette that goes in it. I like that the silicone gasket keeps the paints fairly moist over long periods of time. I like that the color collapsible paint uh, water bucket holds a fair amount of water and you can even put your brushes there on the side or on the top. So I took this out with me to the New Orleans City Park Botanical Garden to see how well this one works in a plein air setting. And while it's not as compact or easy to use as the, the weird watch thing, since you do have to go fetch your own water and then dispose of your own water, I found that it could be a great solution for people who have a very limited workspace and they need a palette that breaks down and is very compact. So this was another superior product that I was just utterly charmed by. Before I dive into the other sets that I think this is comparable to, I want to spend some time like looking at, sorry, this box is so falling apart, it's hard to remember how to open it. I want to spend some time comparing it to the Etcher set, which I think, I think this is who they're white labeling from. I thought it was Paul Rubens for a while, but I think it is superior now. So... Of course, they did their own rebrand swatch card. They do include pigment information and other artists on YouTube have pointed out that their pigment selection is unusual for some of the colors that they picked, right? It, it wouldn't be the normal pick for those colors. And I'm wondering if that extends into the superior set. Now, generally, I do talk about pigments a little bit, but I don't talk about pigments super, super much because, again, my concerns for watercolor are different from other artists' concerns for watercolor. So that's not something I necessarily spend a lot of time talking about. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to isolate some colors that I think are the same in both sets. And we're going from a 48 piece set to a 24 piece set and then compare the pigments in them. Okay, I have so many thoughts. I'm gonna try to get them out in a coherent fashion. One, with the superior set, I didn't realize how many single pigment repetitions there are in this set. Like several of these colors just use the same pigment. And I know that different treatments can bring about different versions of that color, like using what, PB29, you can get a cool blue as well as a warm blue. I'm not talking about that. 
Some of these colors are so similar, there is no reason to have three of the same color that use the same pigments. And I don't know why I didn't really pick on, up on that. I think I kind of did, but I kind of brushed it off figuring that maybe they would just have different properties as we went through the tests and they don't really. So to me, these three are just taking up space. Another thing, I think I have found who Etcher is white labeling from. Now there are some discrepancies, but minus like four colors, four out of 20, they're almost identical. Another thing is I know that, you know, there are just some commonly used pigments for some colors, but there are also some weird inclusions that kind of tip the scale. So I think I figured out who Etcher is white labeling from. And if that's the case, I would say if you're gonna get the Etcher set, if you're thinking about the Etcher set for whatever reason, go ahead and get the superior set. Instead, it is cheaper and you get twice as many colors for like $15 less. You just have to wait for AliExpress to deliver it. So I am going to go through the colors with you guys. And um, if that's not of interest to you, you can just skip to the next section. Basically what I did is minus the white because generally titanium whites pure whites whatever they all use pw6 that's not indicative of much but i went through all the rest of the colors because even when i was reviewing the Escher set i thought there were some strange inclusions and i also thought some of the pigments that they picked were kind of unusual and i also thought the fact that they renamed a bunch of their colors was just kind of like to me a little red flaggy mostly because that's what cheaper companies do because they can't necessarily call it like magenta or whatever sometimes they're trying to be cute and appeal to a different audience sometimes they're trying to kind of hide what's going on and since etcher tries to appeal to artists there isn't really any good reason not to just call it yellow ochre or if you're gonna theme something, theme it all the way through. Like don't call it Burnt Sienna, come up with a cutesy name for it. You guys get what I'm saying? Like there's enough inconsistencies with how they name these that it was kind of throwing up some red flags. So I don't have infinite desk space and I don't have infinite room to show you guys stuff. So I'm gonna do the best that I can. Generally, I eyeballed it. I wasn't looking at the pigment info for the superior set until after. I just kind of picked colors I thought were close and then went back and checked the pigments. And sometimes I would add another color into it because maybe the swatch on this card didn't really reflect the color. So for just yellow, it uses PY36. I am, I'm sorry, lemon yellow, apologies. PY3 versus permanent lemon yellow, PY3. Just yellow is PY36 versus transparent medium yellow uses PY65 versus permanent yellow medium uses PY65. So those are different. But I mean, seriously, that brings up my point of like, so this is permanent yellow medium and that's transparent medium yellow. Like, why do we need both of them? They're the same pigment. They're almost, they're basically the same color. Why do we need, and then cadmium yellow medium is, also, they're like, why do we need three of them? Sorry, just like, we could have had more cool yellows or we could have had more blues, we could have had more greens, but no, we gotta have a bunch of yellows that are basically the same yellow. So for Mighty Ochre, which is a yellow ochre, it's PY42 versus yellow ochre, PY42. Llama Orange, which is PY150 versus Cadmium Orange, which is PY150. Soft Orange, which is PO20 versus Cadmium Orange Yellow, which is PO20. Simply Red, which is PR. 108 versus cadmium red which is pr 108 rogue red which is pr 177 versus matter red which is pr 177 sweet red which is pr 123 and i could not find this is sweet red i couldn't find an immediate analog in here uh, especially because i'd already selected matter red and cadmium red so that's a new one we also have pretty pink which is a magenta light color which is pv19 versus violet which is also pv19 royal purple which is pv23 versus permanent violet which is pv23 so you guys are starting to see a trend here right lime green which is pg36 py74 versus yellow green which is pg36 py74 light leaf green which is pg17 versus hooker's green brilliant which is pg17 and frankly both of them are kind of a muddier version they're almost like an oxide kind of color 
Then we have Emerald Green PG7 versus Emerald Green Deep, which is also PG7. Ocean Turquoise, which is PB36 versus Turquoise Light, which is PB36. Ultramarine Blue, which is this is one of those super common ones that they always use the same pigments, so you know, which is PB29 versus France Ultramarine, which is PB29. Prussian Blue, another one of those they always use similar. Actually, Prussian Blue, I think, usually also uses PB29, so this is a little unusual. Um, Prussian Blue, PB27 versus Pl Prussian Blue, which is PB27. Sky Blue, which is PB15.3 versus, so initially I thought it was the Peacock Blue, and that is PB17, and then I get, because I was kind of torn, See how they swatch? It almost looks like it's somewhere in between the two colors. So then I looked up uh, Sea Blue, which is PB 15.3. Cobalt Blue, PB 28 versus Cobalt Blue, PB 28. Sorry, it gets kind of tongue twistery for me. Umber Brown, which, where is their umber? Their umber, both of their umbers look more like a burnt sienna to me, and I thought that was kind of unusual. Uh, PR101 and PBR7 versus PR101 and PBR7. Brick Brown, which is kind of like um, an Indian red or a Venetian red, which is PR101 versus Pozzuli Red Ochre, which is PR101, and that's a pretty common pigment for that kind of color. Burnt Sienna, which more, looks more like a burnt umber to me. Uh, PBR7 versus PB7, or PBR7, sorry, I probably mistyped that. Then we have dark brown. This one, again, oh, I'm sorry, over here. This one, again, doesn't really have an immediate analog to here once we look at the pigments. I thought it was burned brown at first, which is PBR7. Um, it doesn't contain any PBK, unlike their dark brown, which is PBR7 and PBK7. And so I thought, well, maybe it's Van Dyke brown, but no, that's just PBR7 again. And if we look at them, they are actually pretty close Usually I would think of a Van Dyke brown as being a redder dark brown, so I'm not really sure why they included two here. And then we have Power Black, which is PBK7 and kind of a bluer black. And while Ivory Black, uh, it ends up being Penny Gray, which is PBK7. And I thought maybe um, when I was initially eyeballing it because it's so blue, I thought maybe it was pain, a Payne's Gray, um, which is PB15, PB29, PBK9. No, it's just Penny Black. So there's a lot of colors that are basically the same color that's just been re renamed, same pigments, handled the same, kind of even look the same on their swatch sheets. And they even look the same in their half pans. Like... I had noticed that the superior half pans have kind of a larger half pan plastic. It's kind of a chunky plastic and then a smaller half pan inside. Same thing for the etcher. So I am pretty certain that the etcher watercolors are just rebranded superior watercolors. And since superior does so much white labeling, that shouldn't really be a shock to anybody. Now that we've cleared the air regarding Superior and Etcher, it's time to talk about some not Superior watercolors that are pretty dang comparable. So I've pulled out, I pulled out the cuter of the Paul Rubin sets, the little jewel palette, because this thing kind of stole my heart. But you could sub this in for their regular 24 or 48 half pan palettes. They're pretty similar. Uh, the only thing that really differs is the form factor and the some of the colors are a little bit different but pretty similar so i believe that the paul rubens are poured paint rather especially when we're talking about like the aowin their their student grade brands those definitely seem like poured paints we also have the phoenix watercolors and i know the frugal crafter has a working theory that these are Cotman watercolors and that Windsor Newton is white labeling those. And I actually recently bought another set of Cotman, so I would be interested in doing some head to head. These are so sticky. The reason I don't think these are Cotman is because I've never gotten Cotman that are this sticky. And I, I don't love Cotman watercolors, but these are super duper sticky. In fact, I had really high hopes for these because I don't know. I just, I just did. Uh, the, the case is also just so stinking cute with that like metallic blue, but I haven't field tested these yet. And sometimes brands really surprise me with the field test, but I was actually kind of disappointed in these. I think cause I'd gotten my hopes way high and I needed to manage expectations. So this is the Phoenix 
Artist Watercolors 48 piece set. I also think the Montmartre watercolors are kind of comparable to these. I actually ended up really liking the Montmartre watercolors, but I do need to field test these. My opinion on them might change and they do seem to have shrunken since the initial unbox and swatch, which sometimes does happen with cheaper watercolors. I'm not super sure why. Um, maybe some of the binder just evaporates out. I don't know. I also think these are kind of comparable to Mungyo, mostly because they're right in that price bracket. And Mungyo is another company that white labels all of their stuff to send to others. But the Mungyo watercolors are so much grittier than the Phoenix or than the Superior watercolors. And I still need to do, I have painted with these kind of in the past in that I have used some of the companies that have white labeled from them like Jane Davenport and Prima Marketing and I've done field tests with those, but I've never field tested this set and I'm looking forward to seeing if there's some art supply redemption in there for um, Mungyo like there was for Paul Rubens. And then I grabbed, since this is a student grade showdown and a lot of these are actually in that weird like they would be considered professional grade. They're just cheaper category. I grabbed the Mei Liang or the Pretty Excellent. You can sub this in for the AON. They're the same paints. Um, I grabbed this palette at, because this is the student grade version of Paul Rubens. So we've got, we've got some competition to talk about. And of course, like, you know, I've reviewed a lot, a lot, a lot, so many, so many watercolors like I'm in the student grade showdown. I'm not grabbing like everything right now. I'm focusing on most comparable, what these paints made me think of. So I do have all their, or not all of their, but I have most of their swatches here with me. And I guess I can show you guys, I like how I, I get like really coy about it. It's just, I'm losing desk space rapidly. So these are the Montmartre watercolors. I actually really like these. They're not like the world's best, but they're not priced like they think they're the world's best. They're actually very affordably priced, especially on Amazon. There is some chalkiness to them. Their color mixes are not the most vibrant. If you work with them straight from the half pan, if you're working with the basic colors and we're not talking about the neutrals, their neutrals leave a lot to be desired. They have a lot of color impact. So the Montmartre set could be a good kind of primary color set for like a brush calligrapher or a card maker. It's also very compact and you can refill it if you want to. And what I think I like best about this set and I'm not usually, I'm one for a good gimmick, but I'm not usually one for pack on pack ins is it just seems like a really well made travel set. Like usually these plein air sets are made so poorly. This one actually seems like some thought and care went into it. Now I don't really care about the water brush. I don't care about the sponge. I don't even care about these. Um, mostly I care about the paints and the palette. So I haven't had a chance to field test this. So I'm not hundred percent sure how I feel about it. But that's kind of where we're at with a lot of the paints that are on the table right now. Now, that wasn't that impressive, but I did think the color gradient, I was able to get it with, get with it. And we didn't have any problems with like optical brighteners. There's no harsh lines. It's very soft and blended. And if you're looking for an example of how to do it wrong, you should watch the Arteza unbox and swatch because those paints just fought me on everything. This is an example of how to do it right in basically the same price point as the Artezas. So next I have the Mungyo watercolor. And of course they would be at the bottom of the pile because that is how, that is how life works. So the Mungyo watercolors deliver a lot of saturation. They're fairly inexpensive. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them on AliExpress. Mungyo is a Korean brand. And they're actually, they used to be very popular in the doll community for their soft pastels to like do face ups. So it's, it's not necessarily considered a, you know, a subpar brand. They do white label a lot to other companies. So if you've used any of like the Jane Davenport, like in the little tins or the Prima marketing watercolor confections or the art alternatives tins, those are all Mungyo watercolors. I like that. I want to like them. I kind of like them. My problem is that grittiness is just rough. And I don't mean granulation when I say grittiness. I mean literal grit, not just pigment like particulating out. But much like the 
the Montmartre over there. I'm really kind of hoping these will win me over in the field test where I have a chance to test out a bunch of their colors and just kind of see how that goes. So these are pretty price, so honestly, all of the big 48 sets that are considered master level or the highest quality that brand offers. I feel like they're all kind of similarly priced. You might find them a little cheaper at one place or a little cheaper at another, but they're all kind of in the 30 to $45 price range. And then here is the wet into wet test. I feel like here is where, right? That's the mungyo. Yeah, I had to double check. That's where you can really start seeing some of the grittiness in colors that shouldn't be gritty. You do get some granulation, but there's definitely white halos from some of the yellows. And, and I did try to pick slightly more opaque yellows for that to get that kind of opacity. I just was hoping that the extenders would not separate out. So that is the Mungno. Then next, Ali, I have the, it's written on here, haha, <laughs> the Phoenix. I really wanted to like the Phoenix. I'm not really sure now that I'm like, now that time has passed, but I haven't had a chance yet to do the field test. I'm not super sure why I, other than maybe like the color mixing is not the best. I'm not really sure why I don't like the Phoenix. They seem okay. They, I mean, I'm not, when, even though these are, many of these companies are labeling these as master grade or professional grade, I'm really not holding them to like Sennelier or Holbein standards. I'm, or even really Paul Rubens standards. Not that Paul Rubens isn't nice, but they're very inexpensive for what they are. Um, I'm, I'm kind of comparing them against student grade watercolors because I mean, people throw the word professional grade and fine artist quality around all the time. It's lost any real meaning in terms of marketing. So I, I generally just compare these against the student grade watercolor since they're priced competitively. So now that I'm looking at these, I, mm, that could be why that could be, there's some red flags there. And there's also a muddiness to the colors that I noticed with the superior as well. Um, so yeah, they definitely feel like a student grade, but you do get a lot of color and you do get a lot of color vibrancy. You do get some granulation, but they all lift the same. I feel like that's, that's such a student grade problem. So that's the Phoenix set. Another interesting thing is even though this is a 48 pan palette and it's even smaller than the superior, we have room, we could get an, at least one more pan in each row. And I think it's because the half pans are thinner, like the plastic is thinner, but the half pans themselves are about the same size. So you're getting the same amount of paint and you still have some room. And I love, I love the like automotive shiny blue with the, the Phoenix palette. I, I am a sucker for a good gimmick. And then we have the Paul Rubens. These are the swatches from the half pans, not the little travel pochette, but they're again, very similar here. I swatched the five colors that are different in this palette than in the half pan palette. I just wanted to show this one off for you guys because it's very cute and it's, I think it's an interesting change to the form factor. And I do actually have some problems with this palette, which I talk about in the Art Supply Redemption slash Unbox and Swatch for this. So if you're curious about this palette, you should check it out. But this is also like a $25 palette with I believe 24 half pans, so pretty, pretty good. And the quality is really pretty good. I'm excited to field test this. I've painted with Paul Rubens quite a bit and I generally like their watercolors, but I wanna test this palette. So generally, Paul Rubens is one of those kind of gold standards of what I want to see from this price point. We get like really misty, diffused color. They kind of blend out into each other. I am seeing a little bit of optical brightener rings up here, but I was also using a very opaque green for that. So I'm not super surprised with that. Um, but we do get like some really nice fade outs and blend outs and the colors mixed really easily and really readily on the cotton rag paper. So this is what I'm really hoping to see. And then in terms of student grade standouts, really the Meiliang pigments and the superior folding fan palette are kind of my gold standard for these cheaper student grade palettes that, you know, you use them up and then you upgrade to the next line. 
in that series or or you can switch to a different brand but i feel like these are a good introduction for people who want to get into watercolor and they don't necessarily want to spend a lot of money or they don't have a lot of money to spend and they're not sure that watercolor is really a good fit for them these are inexpensive they're fun good color payoff and they handle like professional grade watercolors not a hundred percent like professional grade watercolors but they handle close enough that you can actually decide if you enjoy watercolor rather than fighting with the paints for who's gonna win you or the paints so that is all the tests for that and of course you guys can most of these have gone live by now you can watch those if you're curious if i've kind of sparked your interest i would love it if you'd watch them by the time i finish this whole student grade showdown i'm gonna release a tiered list i mean they're gonna do it as a live stream or as a video i haven't decided yet of all of the student grade showdown contestants so that if you're looking for like top recommendations you should i should have you covered uh kind of inspired by something that windigoon did for i think he ranked the different conspiracy theories and he explained why he liked them i would like to do the same thing and that way you can kind of make your own decisions just based on the information that i've provided so here is our superior palette the color still really cute basic the same color as the Paul Rubens but then again a lot of companies just buy the palettes from another manufacturer rather than manufacturing their own because that does get expensive and this just has like a little sticker on it so I don't think Superior made this particular palette they probably purchased it from another vendor Finally, it is time for us to talk about the pros and the cons of the Superior Master Level watercolors. So let's start with the good thing. Let's start with the pros. These have really saturated color. They have good pigment payoff, decent granulation in colors that should granulate, and they are at a great price point. The pigment information is also available, which is really helpful. Now, what about the cons? Well, everyone has white labeled this and is selling it for more. So try to track down the source if you can. But if you see like Etcher on a deep discount, that might be a good option. Sadly, seeing those white halos indicate optical brighteners. And while that in and of itself is not the end of the world, it does indicate to me that color mixing and layering might become muddy. But hey, that's why we're gonna do the field test. We gotta see for ourselves. And you're most likely to find this set in its original form on AliExpress. And while there, I don't mind shopping on AliExpress, and I can recommend a place where you can get it that's trustworthy. Some people have had problems with knockoffs, mostly on Wish, which is why I don't really shop on Wish. I haven't had those problems on AliExpress, but I know it can be an issue for some people, especially because there are longer wait times and it has to come from overseas. And what with our current world situation, that's getting increasingly difficult. So that could be a big con. You can't necessarily walk into your brick and mortar and buy this set as it is. So what is my verdict for the Superior 48 Colors Master Level Solid Watercolor Set? I have mixed feelings about this set. In general, I really like what Superior brings to the table, but a lot of that is colored by their interesting palettes and innovative ways of kind of delivering paint to their consumers. And this palette is very straightforward this is a very like run-of-the-mill basic palette and while there's nothing wrong with that it's not bringing that innovation that i really like to see from superior especially because when you review art supplies you see a lot of the same whether it's alcohol markers or watercolors companies constantly copying each other or white labeling from each other so any company that tries to push things and tries to do unusual things and takes risks is already getting points in my book so this format while i think it was necessary to, for completionist sake as part of the student grade showdown this format is not you know the format that makes my heart sing it's not their weird and wonderful palettes that i've grown to love i also am not sure if this palette is really that much better than their student grade palette but the prices are so similar that i'm not sure that that matters either and it was easier for me to find this 48 palette 
than it is for me to find their plastic palette here white labeled by Artify. So, you know, ease of access and convenience do play a factor in how I feel about art supplies. If I have to climb to the top of a highest mountain to get something, I mean, that's really cool, but I can't recommend it either. So this is one of those where the field test is really going to tell me what I need to know. What I do know is I probably don't need to field test those Etcher watercolors because I am pretty sure they are white labeling from Superior. Is that a judgment call? No, absolutely not. Lots of companies white label from other companies. Not everyone can manufacture everything. My real problem is I think the Etcher watercolors are kind of overpriced, especially when you compare them against where they're white labeling from, which naturally would be less expensive because obviously why would you white label from someone who is more expensive than the price point you want to sell it at? But I think the price difference is kind of egregious. So I would recommend if you want to get the Etcher watercolors, just get this set instead. So what did you guys think of this watercolor set? Do you feel like it really lives up to the master level promise? Or do you think Superior offers some other watercolors that are more to your needs or deliver the kind of performance you're looking for? So unfortunately for the life of me, I cannot find the swatches from this review and I only did it last week. so. I, I don't know, it disappeared into the ether. So I can't show them to you here in the end recap, but we can talk about this watercolor set a little bit. So as you guys know, I am a watercolor comic artist. I paint the watercolor comic seven inch Now Kara. that you guys have you about gotten the right skinny here. on the Superior Master Level Watercolor Palette, why don't you take a minute to head on over to 7inchcara.com and check out 7inch Kara. It's basically no risk at all other than the risk of your time because you can read the first eight chapters for free as a web comic and that'll help you figure out if this comic is a good fit for you. As you guys can see, I go through a lot of paints for a comic like that. And while the student grade showdown isn't intended to help me find watercolors that will allow me to paint Kara, it would be nice if some of these kind of dark horses were, you know, to that level. And I do feel like Paul Rubens, especially the two bins, is to the level where I would be comfortable painting Kara with that. But this set even though it says master level and even though it's by a brand named superior i don't think it's really going to cut it for what i need now that said we haven't done the field test yet the field test tends to really kind of help me solidify things and kind of helps me decide whether or not watercolors are better than i thought or worse than i thought so i hope you guys will stay tuned for the field test because that's when I'm really going to be able to make some decisions. Now, I like to separate the unbox and swatch from the field test since we do so many tests in the unbox and swatch and it does take a while to do both. But also because I enjoy treating the field test as kind of a standalone thing and it gives me more space to actually talk about watercolor and the watercolor techniques that I'm trying to implement there. And I swear when I came outside, it was sunny every time, every time. It's like, oh, you're recording. Let's get really loud or let's start to rain or the roofers start roofing again. It's always something, but that's just life here in Southeast Louisiana. So if you have tried this set out, I would love to know what you guys think of it. Do you like this set? Were you disappointed in this set? Are there some other unsung or undersung heroes that I should know about that I haven't reviewed yet as part of the student grade showdown? Let me know down in the comments below. I always love hearing from you guys. I hope this review was helpful, useful, and informative to, for you guys today. I really appreciate you guys voting for this set. I was really curious about it. I'm really glad even though it didn't, I, I still like the folding palette the best. So even though it didn't live up to that for me, oh, and I think the watch palette's really cool too. Even though it didn't live up to that for me, I still really enjoyed getting to take a look at it. 
and I would love to review more of Superior's more innovative watercolor palettes. Those can be a little bit harder to find, but I think they're just really exciting. And I'm always happy to see a company pushing the envelope when it comes to art supplies, whether it's in the presentation or it's in the functionality or if it's in the materials. So, you know, Superior, keep on being you. Please be weird and wild and wonderful because that's what I like about you. And I look forward to seeing you guys again next time in our next either art supply review or tutorial because I do those as well. And hopefully today's review was helpful in helping you guys make art a habit. So reviews like this are only possible thanks to the amazing support of my awesome patrons on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. You guys will see their names 